We live in a day of religious pluralism. And in the days of religious pluralism, people pick and choose the various aspects of religion that help them the most. And so they might take a little bit of Hinduism, and they might take a little bit of Buddhism. They might take a little bit of Christianity and Kabbalah from Judaism, and they kind of mishmash all these things together because the aim in our day and the aim of our age with religion is that it serves to be a therapy for you. It's therapeutic. And because religion is primarily therapeutic, then you, it makes sense that you choose and pick the things that help you the most. And so we live in this religious, religiously pluralistic age. The pluralism of the age actually goes back to this idea that there are an equality of all religions. You might have heard the account, the story of four blind men. Four blind men who approached an elephant, and as they approached, the one blind man first reached, and he, he touched the trunk and thought what he was holding was a snake. And the second blind man held and grasped onto the leg and thought it was the trunk of a tree. The third blind man reached out and felt the tail and thought it was a branch. And the final man, the blind man, came up against the side of the elephant and thought he was touching a wall. We're told in religious pluralism that this is the experience of all people, that all humans experience the divine. It's just different elements of the divine that they experience. And because they experience different elements of the divine, it's all, they're all worshiping the same God, but in light of that, that they're just reaching and grasping for what they can experience and what they can know. In the days of Israel, it was not unlike the days that we are describing now, that every person picks and chooses their own gods. The northern nation, Israel, the ten tribes, had picked and chosen various aspects of the religions around them for the reason that those gods provided very therapeutic needs. But beyond therapy, actually, they provided what they thought were very practical needs. The nations, the nations around them had gods that would help you with fertility so that your crops would grow well, grow well, that you'd have lots of kids. They'd have gods of weather so that you could get the right weather to grow your crops. They'd have gods who promised blessing and, and growth and, and the spread of all things good. And so there was this picking and choosing, and that had ultimately led to the northern kingdom's demise. They had fallen by the wayside. When Hezekiah, the king of Judah, the southern kingdom, had seen what had happened to the northern kingdom, it was a wake-up call. And we're told in chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, that Hezekiah was the most faithful king that there was in all of Israel's history from the time of David till there was no king on the throne. That he was the king par excellence. That he had torn down the altars to the, the foreign gods. That he had even taken the bronze serpent that Israel had used in the wilderness. And he had destroyed it when Israel had turned that into a form of idolatry themselves. He was a faithful king. And as a result of his faithfulness, as Assyria, that nation that Jonah, that we talked about last week, that Jonah had gone to, as Jonah had prophesied and prayed and spoken a word, a message to them, the Syria had come and overrun the northern kingdom. And Hezekiah, knowing the warnings, had turned and trusted in the Lord. And he was faithful in his day. He had heeded those warnings as a faithful king. Now, what made King Hezekiah faithful? It's a question that we need to wrestle with this morning. Because in a day of religious pluralism where there are many gods that are abounding, I think we also need to wrestle with the question of how do we be faithful? And King Hezekiah provides us with some insights there that will ultimately lead us, as all of the Old Testament stories that we've been going through, they point us to the glory of Christ. So three things I want us to see from Hezekiah about faithfulness. And I want us to see it for ourselves. And the first is that we are to be faithful to the one true word. Now, if I'm going to summarize here what's just happened, the passage that I've read, uh, the massive portion of this passage that I've read, we could summarize it by this. Hezekiah had heeded the warning of Israel falling and he revolted against Assyria, not trusting in this superpower. 
And as a result, the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, had wanted tribute to be paid. Hezekiah would strip the gold from the temple and take the silver from his, his, own, uh, his own resources, giving 30 tons of silver and 3 tons of gold to the king of Assyria, and that would not be enough. The king of Assyria would lay siege. He would want to surround Jerusalem and destroy it. If you rebel, this is what the superpower of this age will do. And yet, what ultimately this the issue that boils, it boils down to here in chapter 18 and 19 is a question of whose name will you listen to? What word will prevail? In chapter 18, verse 19, we hear the field commander says to the people, Say to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria. And in verse 28, again, the field commander stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is the first word that is spoken, the word of the king of Assyria. But there's another word that is spoken, and we hear of that word in chapter 19, verse 6, and chapter 19, verse 20. That when Hezekiah hears these words, he sends for Isaiah, and in verse 6 it says, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, thus says the Lord. Or again in chapter 19, verse 20, Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. We have here the contrast between two words. Will we listen to the word of the king of Assyria, or will we listen to the word of the Lord? And as this word is being proclaimed, that is the ultimate question that, that comes to the forefront. What word are you going to trust? What word are you going to listen to? What word is going to guide you? We live in an age where there are lots of cultural voices. There are lots of cultural voices about lots of cultural issues and trying to address issues of justice and inequity, and they're, they're rightfully raising concerns. However, Will we listen to the word of the Lord which gives us the direction as to how we will address those issues or will we listen to the word of the culture? The culture proposes one solution which is at complete odds so often to the word of the Lord. This is why as a church our first value is to be biblical. That we value the word of the Lord. That all of the cultural pressures and moments and movements that are going on can be addressed by this word, which is sufficient for life and for godliness. It is sufficient to guide us in understanding all of the problems of abuse, of power and neglect, and the gender inequity and the racial tensions and all of those issues. This is the word. And if we will heed this word then the cultural moment, which offers us, it offers us a utopia. It says that we can have pleasure, and you can find your pleasure by heeding this word, and that if you seek this word from the culture, then you'll find joy, and you'll find life, and you'll find hope. There is a different word that comes from the word of the Lord, and it's a word that says, will you endure in these times? Will you listen to the word of the Lord? And by listening to the word of the Lord, find that his word offers joy forever. Not just for a fleeting moment. And it's not a utopian ideal, but a reality grounded in the certain promises that God has made. Will we heed the word of the Lord? The second thing, though, that Hezekiah is called to be faithful to is he, he's faithful not only in heeding the one true word, but it's a call ultimately to be faithful under pressure. If we go back to this story, Hezekiah has rebelled. We see that in chapter 18, verse 7. And he is commanded to give tribute to the king of Assyria. So he strips the temple and his own wealth he gives from his, his own um, palace, but for Sennacherib, that is not enough. And so he sends three of his top officials to meet with three of Hezekiah's top officials, and they gather at the aqueduct, just at the edge of the highway, we're told, and as they get there, the field commander basically issues a challenge. And the challenge goes like this, beginning in verse 19. Who are you going to trust? 
Are you going to trust Egypt? Verse 21. Are you going to trust in Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel? Are you going to trust in your own strength? If I gave you 2,000 horses, you couldn't even man those 2,000 horses. Assyria, basically, the argument goes, has been blessed by God. And God has commanded and issued that Assyria is coming up against the people of Jerusalem. So how can you stand against the Lord when the Lord's against you? How can you withstand the power of Assyria? Now, Hezekiah's men are, it seems like they're shaking in their boots. They're a little bit nervous, and they're saying, hey, listen, would you speak to us in Hebrew, in, Ju- in the Judean language, instead of in, or in, in Aramaic? We understand Aramaic, instead of speaking to us in, in Hebrew, because all the men on the wall can hear this. This isn't good for morale, right? Like, if you're shouting at us and telling us what you're going to do in our own language, and all the men of the wall, the warriors hear this, this is going to be disastrous. And the field commander says, no, no, they need to hear this. Hezekiah has offered a trust, a trust in the Lord, that the Lord will deliver. But he's so mistaken. He's, He's actually torn down the high places and he, it's interesting what the field commander says. He's torn down the high places that, that pleased Yahweh. He's, he's doing all these things. If you want a future, if you want food and water, verses, um, really from verses 28 on, if you want to go to the promised land, we'll take you to the promised land. We'll take you to a land where you can eat figs and have your own water, and you can have grain and wine and bread and vineyards, a land of olives and honey. This is a promised land. We'll we'll take you there. Then you better obey the word, the word of the king of Assyria. The response of Hezekiah's men in verses 36 and 37 at the end of chapter 18 is obedience to Hezekiah. He had said, don't respond. Be silent. And that's exactly what they do. And when Hezekiah receives word in chapter 19... Of all these things, chapter 19, verse 1, as soon as Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. He sends for Isaiah the prophet. That prophet, we've got an entire book by this man, Isaiah of Amos, and the the, the words of his prophecy are, are kept for us. And he prophesies about the end of Assyria and its destruction. And this very much matches the words that Isaiah had spoken in Isaiah 9, that doom and darkness and dread would come over the land. But Isaiah uh, Isaiah 9, verses 4 and 5, the Lord would deliver Israel. He would deliver Judah from the hand of this superpower. And so he calls for this moment of faithfulness under pressure. What happens when we face pressure? The choice is there. Will we trust in the word of the Lord or will we just surrender to exhaustion? I can't do it anymore. I'm just going to give up. I can't keep going. We all have gotten to that place. We've all felt like quitting and just we're, we're exhausted. We can't keep up the resolve because we're thinking that there is something that we just can't do, and yet the call for us in the, in, in the moment of pressure is will we give up or will we trust in the Lord? And so there is this call to be faithful under pressure, that to be under pressure is a call for us to trust in the Lord in fresh and new ways. It's an opportunity for us to depend upon God, the God who is our strength and our hope. So we're called to be faithful to that one true word. We're called to be faithful under pressure. And finally, we're called to be faithful in prayer. This is what Hezekiah does. When, when word comes back from Sennacherib that, I, that Hezekiah is not going to give in, that Egypt, Egypt is advancing, The word comes from the field commander again. Listen, Yahweh is deceiving you. He's a liar. You can't trust him. How can you trust him? And there goes this list in verses chapter 19, verses 8 through 13. We really hear at the end of that section of a list of cities 
There's more cities that the king of Assyria has conquered, and they include cities in the northern kingdom, the kingdom of, of Israel. And so the response of Hezekiah in this threat, the threat, the looming threat of a superpower coming in is verses 14 through 19. And what does he do? When he receives the letter from, Hez- from Sennacherib, we are told, this is amazing, he received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it, and Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. He takes Sennacherib's letter and, and he opens it up and he's in the temple and he lays it out before, the, before the, the Lord and he prays these words. Verse 15. O Lord, the God of Israel enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you've made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations in their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but works of men's hands, the, of wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. Do you notice how he prays? He prays, first of all, to the God who has made everything. You're the God who has made the heavens and the earth. Second, he prays to the God whose name is being mocked. Lord, your name, it's your reputation that's at stake. It's your glory that's at stake. And the third thing that he prays for is for the glory of God to be seen in all of the world. That, that you alone, O oh God, would be seen as God of the nations. That you're not just the God of Judah, of Jerusalem, but you're the God of the world. You're the God who is Lord of lords. And as he prays this, Isaiah, we're told, sends word. And the basic word that comes back is this. Listen, God is going to keep his promise The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Verse 31. That's a phrase that's repeated in Isaiah 9, and it's repeated again in Isaiah, I think, Isaiah 37. It's this phrase that Isaiah uses. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The zeal of the Lord of the armies, the God of the armies, will accomplish this. And what is he going to accomplish? I'm going to send you a sign. You're going to stay put, and you're not going to be deported out of Jerusalem now. And Sennacherib will not even lay a siege against the city. But instead, he'll return back to his own place, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. And when the people woke up in the next morning, there were 185,000 dead from the angel of the Lord. Now, Hezekiah is not a perfect king. In we don't have time to go into 2 Kings 20. He has the Babylonian envoys come and he shows them the gold and the riches of the, that still remain of the temple. And he, he really tries to allure them with a, a sense of, you know, be on our side so that we've got protection against Assyria. But overall, the overall aim that Kings presents, and even in Isaiah, his prophecy, it presents Hezekiah even though he has moments of failure and deep failure, he's presented as a faithful man. He's presented as being faithful to the word of God and to the promises of God. And he is faithful in prayer. And the question for us then becomes this. What will we depend upon? Will we depend upon, and I use that word intentionally, will we depend upon our strategies and our alliances and our allegiances and all of the things that we can do? Or will we depend upon the Lord in prayer? What will we depend upon? If it's God who is going to build his kingdom and his kingdom will endure, then what will we build everything upon? 
You see, all of these aspects of Hezekiah's faithfulness and the story of Hezekiah in uh, 2 Kings chapters 18 through 20 are intended for us, like all other Old Testament accounts, to help us see the glory of Christ. The way that the writer of 2 Kings presents this is that it's like a deliverance that happened earlier in Israel's history. That Israel had experienced a deliverance at Passover, in Egypt, in the book of Exodus. And just like in the days where the people were enslaved in Egypt, back in Exodus, we have the similarities here. We have the similarities of the gods being threatened, the gods of the nations being threatened. You see how Hezekiah prays, they're no gods at all. That's why Assyria can overrun them. They're, the gods of the nations are not real gods. And the Lord had, had done his decreation work in Egypt, destroying the gods of the age, taking each one of the gods of the age of Egypt and showing that they were powerless through the ten plagues. And in the same way, the God of Israel, the God of Judah, is the God who is being threatened here by those who are no gods at all. And just like the final plague in Egypt was the angel that passed over the land, and wherever there was no blood on the door and 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 of the head and the hilt of the door, the angel would pass over those houses where there was blood, but where there was none, the firstborn would die. And he would deliver his firstborn son. The Lord would deliver his firstborn son out into the wilderness so that his firstborn son might go and worship him there. And in the same way here, we have the angel of the Lord coming and bringing death. Bringing death to 185,000 Assyrian troops. Now, when we read the book of Isaiah... Isaiah is full of prophecy from beginning to end. It's just full of prophecy. He's prophesying against the nations, and one of those nations is Assyria. And he speaks about, Isaiah speaks about Assyria in chapter 9. The gloom and darkness and dread will cover the land, but, but there will come this deliverance that will happen, and that there will be a deliverance that comes, Isaiah 9, verses 4 and 5. And this is the deliverance that Isaiah is speaking of. Now, as much as Isaiah is full of prophecies, there is one section in the book of Isaiah that is full of narrative. The rest is prophecy. And it's Isaiah 36 through 39, which recounts this account here. It recounts the story of Sennacherib and the Assyrian invasion and the Babylonian envoy. And it it is Isaiah's recollection. He uses this memory here from 2 Kings 18 through 20. And as he says what's going on, Isaiah says to Hezekiah, listen, there will be a time when Judah will go into exile. But it won't be, Hezekiah, it won't be in your day. And what Isaiah does is fascinating. He retells the story of Hezekiah's faithfulness under pressure in trusting the Lord and then moves to chapter 40, where he begins with the promise of a new exodus. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly, Jerusalem, for her sins have been paid for twice over. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. Every valley will be raised up. Every mountain will be be made low. And this is the prophecy, and Isaiah sees in the future that what will happen is there will come a suffering servant, a servant of the Lord, who will deliver his Israel. And as he delivers his Israel, what he will do is that this suffering servant will come, and he will be revealed as the power of God, as Isaiah 53 verse 1 says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. And he grew up before him like a shoot out of dry ground, and there was nothing beautiful or majestic in him. And we all like sheep have gone astray. But this suffering servant, do you know what he does? He takes on himself the iniquities of us all. And when Mark writes his gospel. How does Mark begin his gospel? 
The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. And Mark sees that the new exodus that Isaiah promised in the days of Hezekiah is now coming true in Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the one who leads his people out of bondage and out of slavery. It is Jesus who delivers and rescues his people. It is Jesus whom we are told in Mark 10, verse 45, who is the ransom for many that, prophes- that takes that prophecy of Isaiah 53 and says it's coming true, that the one who is the faithful and true one who never failed, we all have failed, but there is one who never failed, and it is the Lord Jesus And so we put our trust in him. You put your trust in anybody else and guaranteed they will let you down. Because we're all more culturally bound than we realize. Do do you realize that? That we're actually more bound to the gods of this age than we can even recognize? That the theories about the sexual revolution and about how to pursue justice and how to reconcile things... These things are wrapped up in the gods of this age. Unless we understand how distorted the gods of this age have caused us to be, we won't be any different than the Pharisees who are like the idol worshipers. That's how Mark portrays the Pharisees. They're just the blind guides who are like what Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 6. You go, speak to these people, as the Lord says to Isaiah, but they'll be hearing but not understanding. They'll be blind. They won't understand. But there is one, the Lord Jesus, who comes. And as he comes, he brings about a faithfulness so that we can be faithful. Not perfect, but faithful. And the faithfulness that we have is because God is faithful. God's faithful to his promise. I'll always have my promise to David kept, and I will not let my name be forsaken. That this is what the Lord says through the prophet Isaiah, that he'll defend his name and he'll defend his glory. You see, in a day of religious pluralism, we hear of the man who grabs the trunk and think the trunk of the elephant who thinks he's got a snake, the man who grabs the tail and thinks he's got a branch, the blind man who grabs the, the leg and thinks he's got the trunk of a tree, and the man who presses against the side of the elephant and who thinks that he's got a wall. And while they're all having different experiences of the same animal, The problem is that their experience is interpreted wrongly. That each one of them interprets what they're experiencing and attributing it to some sort of of thing that they think, well, it's all the same. But they're all wrong. It's not a tree or a branch or a trunk or a wall. It's an elephant. And because it's an elephant that they're touching and, and experiencing... Their same experience is met with a wrong description. And that wrong description won't bring the therapeutic satisfaction that we want when we pick and choose of the gods of this age. Guaranteed, it will never satisfy. Because the gods of this age promise us a utopian ideal that they cannot ever deliver on. They can't. Because they're made of wood and stone. They're made of fleeting pleasures. But as Paul can say in Romans 8, verse 18, this light and momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal, eternal weight of glory. That the little bit of trouble in our lives that is this long pales, it pales in comparison to all of this joy that God has for us by being steadfast and faithful. Which is why the Apostle Paul can say in Galatians 5, Verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. So don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Stand firm. Stand firm. And as we stand firm, what we find is that God reveals to us 
that we can see the big picture. It's his revelation. It's not our brilliance. It's not our ingeniousness. Because he is the one true God, and Jesus is unique among all the gods. Because there is no other God other than the Lord Jesus. And so he calls us to be faithful. And how will we be faithful? He has always been faithful to his promises. He is always faithful to defend his namesake and to defend his glory and defend his people. And if God is faithful, if he is faithful to himself and to his namesake, then that is the foundation for all of your faithfulness that is required of you. That it's not what you have to muster up in an age of religious pluralism, but his faithfulness, which will give you the strength to endure. So, who will you trust? What word will you listen to? What glory will you see as you turn to in prayer?